When you think of the word home, as you've journeyed through this past few weeks, what is the word or what is the theme that comes to your mind? For me, it's a safe place. That's what comes to my mind. You know, when you were younger, maybe it's just me. I've been thinking a lot, like, sometimes I'm like, you remember this time? And people are like, I think that's just you. (laughs) You remember when you were, like, playing and, like, punk kids would do something and then they would, like, run home? You could always know where a punk kid, like, he would do something and then they would run home, right? They would push you and then run back to the safe place, right? In games, we, we do something, we have a home base, and that's the safe place. And I could always, you could always find a kid, you know, when I was younger, um, my parents saw a kid use the restroom outside of our house, (laughs) outside of our door. It was just a punk kid thing, right? And my parents tracked that kid back to their safe place, back to their home. And when I was a student here at Southwestern, I was journeying from the subway, not the station, but the subway restaurant, here on Old Betsy, and I was with a friend, and it was late at night, and we had done a lot of studying, and Subway is not my first choice. That is like ultimate last choice for me. Um, But my friend lived behind the Dollar General, you know, that green, the little knoll, and then there's housing. And my friend lived behind there. And she was like, let's go to Subway, and I was like, fine. And then we journeyed behind the Dollar General to like go over the grassy area, and hit the housing there. I didn't live there, but my friend lived there. I lived further, further up, further up. So most of you probably have that picture in your mind behind the subway and you go further up. So we got there and my friend always has her spidey senses tingling. And she noticed that as we were walking along and talking, there was a car trailing us and we were just walking. And me, I thought that I was pretty like aware of my surroundings, but I didn't notice that the car was following us. She was, she was also a dispatcher for the Keene police at that time, so she was probably more aware of things than me. And I remember dropping her off by walking her to her door and saying like, hey, good night, I'm gonna go home and study more. So I took off and she closed the door and then she was like, no, no. She opened the door and she saw that car take off. And she was like, car's following her. So she went and she got her husband and said, can you go drive and check on April and go to her house? And he was like, oh, why, why? And she's like, I think a car is following her. So get yourself together, get some keys, get some clothes on and go follow her. And I'm here walking through the housing, not minding my own business. And I get to the road, kind of to my road, but I'm walking and the car turns and there's headlights behind me. Obviously, I'm on this side of the road, so I'm walking, and the car's behind me. And the headlights are on me, behind me. And I'm like, you know, I don't feel, I always don't like, I don't like being, even if I'm on the curb, I don't like being in front of a car in the middle of the night. So I just decided to move to the other side of the road. You know, this is where cars come now, so this car can just go past. And I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm not anxious, not anxious. The car moved behind me. And now I'm walking and I'm like, I'm anxious. (laughs) I'm very nervous right now. Why is this car behind me? And this car should be over here. Why is this car behind me? And you know those memes where it's that lady and all those mathematical equations are like going on. That was, I was like, what am I doing now? What do I do now? What do I do now? And I was just going through every scenario and I'm like, my house is so far from, like my house is too far for me to run. I have a big backpack on. And I was like, what do I do? And then the car speeds up. And I'm like, I am very nervous now. (laughs) The car speeds up and the lights get bigger in my vision in front of me. And I just leapt. I threw myself onto the yard of the house that was on the corner of my street. And because I threw myself, the backpack momentum of books went forward and I tumbled over and I got up. And I was like, okay, two scenarios. This car's, no, three scenarios. This car's gonna keep going. Second, or they're gonna stop and they're gonna be like, ha ha, April. And I'll be like, why, who are you? Like a friend or something. 
or three, this is my death. The car hit its brakes, and I'm like, okay, it's not going forward. It backed up, and I'm like, okay, I'm ready for a friend to come out and being like, ha ha. And what got out of the car were four or five men with bats. And I will tell you, the blood drained from my body. There was no way I could outrun those guys. And my house was just too far. Mind you, this is keen. <laughs> this is keen not to be like, Keen's supposed to be a safe place, <laughs> right? I sat there and I was like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I can't go anywhere. The, the backpack's heavy. The keys to my house are in my backpack. The house is over there. And I remembered, you know, all of this is happening in a split second, but it feels like a movie, like really slow motion. I remembered that the yard that I'm in, the lady that owns this property, the house, is a lady that used to babysit me when I was a little kid. She was an old lady then, she was an old lady at that time, and I was like, I can go to her house. I don't know what I'm gonna do, I can't get in, it's nighttime, but I ran for that porch, for that door, and I held the door like there was an invisible key that I was unlocking, and just as predictable as every elderly person, all the lights around the house came on because they were motion sensor. Every light lit up, that whole yard lit up, and it looked like I had a refuge. It looked like I was safe. I reached for the door, and suddenly, just as if it was a snap, all the lights came on, and they froze, and they got in their car, and they drove away, and I jetted to my house. I didn't have to be home to be safe, but I needed a refuge. So for me, so for me, when I think of home, I think of a safe place. And previously, you may have heard of home as a garden, as a table, and even as a journey. But I would argue that one of the most powerful and poignant themes of home is a refuge. And I would say that people in the biblical narrative agree with me, including the psalmist. It's mentioned 40 times over 40 times in the book of Psalm, as God is our refuge. Our, our scripture for today, I'm just going to read it again, if you want to turn in your Bibles or you can look on the screen. It says, my salvation and honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. I just want to sample some other verses in the Bible, in the Old Testament exclusively, about the word refuge. Here are a few. Psalms 91, verse 4. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. Psalms 119, verses 114. You are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Nahum 1 verse 7, I love this verse. The Lord is good, amen? A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. There is a pattern. There is a pattern with the theme in the word refuge. And when we read the word refuge in these verses as an example, what it is most likely referencing is the cities of refuge in the land of Canaan. Biblically and historically, you will find symbolically as well, six cities were designated as an asylum for those both foreigners and Israelites who had committed unintentional manslaughter. They offered protection and possible, from possible retribution from offended family members. So basically, the whole rule, an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, if there was an unintentional manslaughter, one could run to these cities of refuge and they could be safe from the offended family until the day of trial. So they were safe as long as they reached a city of refuge. 
And the interesting part about these cities of refuge is that they were strategically placed. You were never far away from one. You were never more than a day or half a day, no matter where you were in the land of Canaan from these six cities. And all the obstructions on the road and all the way to get to the cities were clearly marked. There were no, nothing that blocked you from going. All of the rivers had bridges and all of the byways had clearly marked signs. Can you see the symbolism? And the Levites, the priests, once a year would make sure that they were perfectly maintained. This is the symbolism for our refuge as Christ. And I would ask as a question for us as believers, are we making sure that all the bridges are maintained and all the rivers have bridges and all the byways are clearly marked and there are no obstructions to people getting to their refuge in Christ? God is our refuge. This is more than just a word. This is something that is spoken from in these verses from an experience. There's a difference between seeing someone live something and you living it out. And the temptation for us is when we see the antiquated word refuge is like we have a modern perspective. The tendency of our limited way of conscribing our imagination to the word refuge is that it is a temporary place, right? You run away from it and then you come back to it when you need it. But I would argue and submit to you today that your home or your refuge is what makes you who you are. And it never leaves you. It's always on you, whatever it might be. Whatever you believe makes you safe whatever you believe gives you control is in fact your home. It's what you act from, it's what you believe from, and it's where you think from. Whether that be trust in humanity's scientific progression, your nationality, your friendship group, your culture, your wealth, and your abilities, whatever else takes priority in your life or whatever else you make your God is your refuge. And the world will tell you that the refuge is something that you can control, right? You decide, but God's refuge, you don't know what's coming. Just in my story, I had no idea I was in danger until it was almost too late. We can't control anything. Even if we are told that we can, it doesn't make that it's true. The language of the Old Testament reveals different things that we seek refuge from. For example, physical elements, in the verse for example, enemies, emotional and spiritual attack. These are things that happen in your life that you find truly unavoidable. You cannot, you cannot navigate your way around them forever. One day, one of these things is going to make you seek refuge. And when you find that refuge, it's going to reveal to you what you put your trust in and what your home is based from. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, I love the way he puts it. He says, we leave room for God only out of our anxiety. But there is a need for us, he goes on to say, to speak of God not at the boundaries, but in the center. That's where our refuge is. So when the Bible talks about the word refuge, it's speaking about where my every moment trust is in. What is my gut reaction? What is my crutch? What is my go-to thing? What is that? That's your refuge, and that is your home. And you may be thinking, April, that is wonderful, but I am not in a good place right now, and I'm not in a place where I see God as my refuge, and I don't even know how to kind of connect to that. 
And I have very good news for you. The attributes of the city of refuge. Jesus, your savior, is always close at hand. Never, never far. Just as the city of refuge was never far from any foreigner, any unbeliever or any believer, Jesus is never far away from you. Your savior, the rock of your salvation, that mighty rock that you find your security and your refuge is, is never far from you. The Lord of salvation is within your reach. He's never far. Charles Spurgeon puts us going to these cities of refuge in this way. This is a picture of the road to Christ Jesus. It is no roundabout road of the law. It is no obeying this or that or the other. It is a straight road. Believe and live. It is a road so hard that no self-righteous man can tread it. Yet so easy that every sinner who knows himself or herself to be a sinner may by it find his way to salvation. My favorite part, my favorite attribute of the city of refuge as we think about refuge as our home, is that you didn't have to run to the center of the city, to the church, to the Mecca, to the mid, to be saved. You just needed to get to the gate. You just needed to get to the boundaries. And like us, you don't have to be at the center of theological knowledge and understanding to know Jesus. The message is simple. Believe and live. And on your way, your leprosy, your frustrations will be healed. If Jesus has spoken that word and said, go to that refuge city, go to me, on the way there, you will be healed. You don't have to get to the center. You just need to get into the gate. I would rather be a doorkeeper at heaven than be in the middle of progress here on earth. You don't have to touch the head. You don't have to touch the shoulder. You just need to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. That small mustard seed is all you need to bring you to your refuge, to bring you home.